The third type is, or general target, is the ribosome. Now, again, we're on the last step now from RNA to protein, and this is the ribosome. There are many, many antibiotics and antibiotic classes that affect the ribosome. They cause it either to simply stop working or to make lots of mistakes in uh, protein synthesis. Some examples are shown here. Now, because this is such a big target, there are so many antibiotics affecting it, I'm going to go into more detail. So this just shows a strand of amino acids, which is what a protein is. And here is, shows how the ribosome actually works. I'm going here. So here's the ribosome. It is reading a messenger RNA, and it does that by looking at the codons here. A codon is three nucleotides. So for example, this one is AAA. Then the ribosome recognizes this. A tRNA, which is a, a molecule which can bring amino acids to the ribosome, brings the correct amino acid to the ribosome. So AAA should uh, encode lysine. And so it brings a lysine to the ribosome. The next one is GAU, and it will bring aspartic acid. So this ha happens, the ribosome moves along the RNA strand, adding the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one all brought to the ribosome by these tRNAs. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think the antibiotic that inhibits the ribosome, remember it's preventing protein synthesis, do you think it's likely to be bacteriostatic or bactericidal? Because it's a little bit of a trick question because the answer is it's both. Uh, so, it depends on the antibiotic. They're usually actually bacteriostatic. And the reason is, if you stop protein synthesis, as you just said, you stop everything, they're going to die eventually, but they're not going to die immediately. But then other antibiotics uh, can uh, mess up the ribosome in how it's making proteins. So instead of just stopping, it makes really messed up proteins. It puts random amino acids in there. And what that does is produces, quote unquote, bad proteins. And some of those end up in the membrane and can cause the cell to actually break open. So it's both is the real answer. Now I'll show you quickly a few examples of the type of uh, antibiotics that affect the ribosome. This one, you saw in the video at the very beginning, you have the mRNA, the two subunits of the ribosome, and the tRNA have to come all together. There is one antibiotic, or maybe more, but this one for sure, casugamycin that blocks this assembly. So this just stops all protein synthesis. And then if we look at what's called the elongation cycle, here you have a ribosome with the first tRNA, and then the next one comes in, and the peptide bond is made, it moves over, and then it starts over and over and over. There are antibiotics that affect all of these steps. For example, doxycycline prevents the tRNA from coming in. Chloramphenicol prevents the amino acid from being added to the growing chain, and spectinomycin prevents the tRNA from moving over, or the ribosome from moving over, and uh, making room for the next tRNA. So overall, there are more than 20 types of uh, antibiotics that affect the ribosome. They can bind directly to the smaller or large subunit of the ribosome, or to factors that help in translation. Like those tRNAs have to be made, and there are antibiotics that affect that as well. So another type of antibiotic, K2, 
can target metabolism. And that's shown here. There aren't very many of these. So in metabolism, you need to make certain things to the building blocks of cells. And one of those things is called tetrahydrofolic acid. Tetrahydrofolic acid is a cofactor for many essential uh, reactions in the cell. Trimethoprim and sulfonamide that block that pathway. So the cell starves for tetrahydrofolic acid, and this prevents growth, basically. Another target of antibiotics is the membrane. So we talked about the cell wall before. Now I mean the actual membrane, the, lipo, uh, sorry, the uh, lipid membrane. Polymyxins target the gram-negative bacteria and disrupt the membrane. They act like a detergent. If you add detergent to oil, you know it solubilizes it. Polymyxin works that way. And it only works on gram-negative because it binds to a specific uh, molecule called lipopolysaccharide. So last week, I simplified the membrane a little bit. Here is the inner membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane with proteins in it. And then you have the peptidoglycan in the middle and the outer membrane in gram-negative bacteria. The outer membrane not only has proteins, it has something called lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide have a lipid part that is in the membrane and then a polysaccharide part that is sticking out. This is actually what can make you very sick uh, from, there's a toxic shock syndrome if you get an infection with E. coli or salmonella. This actually can cause a lot of the damage. Polymyxins bind to this molecule and then dissolve the membrane. So overall, antibiotics target processes that are important for the bacteria, but also our cells. For example, protein translation in the ribosome are essential for human cells as well as bacterial cells. I have another little question for you. Why do you think these antibiotics only make the bacterial cells die or stop growing and don't affect you? In other words, if you took an antibiotic that stopped protein synthesis, if it affected your cells, you'd be dead. How come you don't die? Some antibiotics target structures not present in human cells, as we said, for example, the cell wall. And the antibiotics that do target common structures, like the ribosome, uh, target proteins that are significantly different in humans than they are in bacteria. Okay, so now I want to move on to where do antibiotics come from? Well, in the case of penicillin, it's produced by a fungus, I told you last week. Other uh, antibiotics are produced by bacteria, many of them. Polymyxins in particular are made by gram-positive bacteria and target gram-negative bacteria. Streptomyces, which is a common soil bacteria, is thought to produce hundreds of different antibiotics. Actually, very few antibiotic classes or new types of antibiotics have been developed by chemists in the lab. Fluoroquinolones is an example. So a lot of the antibiotics produced by natural sources are modified by chemists to work better, but they're usually not the, discovered initially in the lab for various reasons. And you'll hear more about that in a few weeks when the medicinal chemist talks. So I just said polymyxins are produced by gram-positive bacteria and target gram-negative bacteria. And many of in streptomyces produces a lot of different antibiotics. Why? Why do you think this would be? So protect themselves from, there could be predators, but also uh, food. There's competition for food in the environment. So they're often produced by bacteria, we think, to kill off the competition. 
If you kill off everything else, you get all the food, basically. So that's the simple answer. Although, again, uh, I should mention this is probably not the only answer. There's probably multiple reasons, but it's a big reason. All right, so what I just presented to you today and last week is this. It's a lot of information here, but I've gone through it already. So here's the cell indicating all the targets for antibiotics. Last week, I talked about beta-lactams, which are penicillin, for example, that target the cell wall. I'll mention vancomycin in a little while that also affects the cell wall. I mentioned those that affect um, metabolism, those that affect DNA, those that affect RNA, and all of these are affecting the ribosome, protein synthesis, and polymyxins that affect the cell membrane. I think we'll break now before I go on to antibiotic resistance.